Good morning. My name is Leila. I'm one of the registrars at UCT. And um, this morning, um, we will be having a case discussion on autosclerosis. Um, so this is just an outline of what I'm talking about. Um, I'll start off with the case presentation. So we had a 57-year-old female with a background of hypertension, previous CA ovary, and her treatment included a platinum-based uh, chemotherapy regimen, including cisplatin, and this was in 2017. And then she presented to us in EMT with a uh, problem of bilateral progressive yearly loss, which was worse on the right compared to the left, and this was since 2017. She had a trial of yearly head on the left, and she had minimal improvement on she had also bilateral ophthalgia, was on the right, bilateral non parsifal tinnitus. She had no vertical and no trauma history. On social history, she was a non smoker and a retired average club, no history of working in a noisy environment, and she had no family history of hearing loss. Technically, she was generally quite well looking. Um, on the ear exam, she had bilaterally normal external auditory canals, and both the panic membranes were intact. She had a short sight. And those exam is normal and the rest of the ENT exam is normal. Um, further um, audiometric testing, so she had a uh, genetic test that showed um, bilateral bone conduction uh, better than head conduction. Her weaver localized the midline and the cranial nerve exam was essentially normal. Um, we did a form of audio for her, which showed a mixed pattern of hearing loss, so she had a moderate to severe sense of neural hearing loss with a conductive component. As well as a card notch between one to two kilohertz. We did an MRI lab done, uh, which was done on the basis of asymmetry, and this was normal. And we also did a CT of the temporal bones. So these are just the skulls of um, slices of, that are selected from her CT. Um, and essentially, at each of these levels, um, there, were, there was no um, features, typical features of autosclerosis. So, included in the differential um, autosclerosis, this is one of sensory neural hearing loss secondary to chemotherapy. This was, this was only because it was the only identifiable risk factor she had for hearing loss. It was, however, thought to be less likely because typically we would expect to see a bilateral symmetrical high frequency hearing loss. However, she had no baseline treatment would be able to compare this one. In terms of what we did for her and our outcome, so she had an excretion for hemoptomy by an in oral approach. And what we found is a fixed stapler's foot plate. Um, we then did a sacrodotomy and insertion of the piston for her. Post operatively, she had a really good course. So she just had some self limiting vertigo. She had no pain on seven fallout. Um, she subjectively um, described an improvement in her hearing. And she's due for follow up audio in the next month. So just to keep up with the, with the discussion, so um, hearing loss is a problem that affects the educational, psychological, and social 360 million people worldwide. And otosclerosis is a process of progressive pathological bone rewilding, and it's one of the more complex diseases that can lead to hearing loss, and it um, essentially affects the body capsule. So you get evident um, bone deposits that surround and appear to be ossicles, and in this case, the mechanical transmission of sound leads to a conductive hearing loss. These lesions may also extend into the bony labyrinth and affects the cochlea, um, which results in a sensory neural hearing loss um, or mixed hearing loss. In terms of um, epidemiology, In terms of epidemiology, so the typical um, average age of onset is 30 to 45 years old. It's very really rare when it occurs less than 10 years old or more than 40, but in, as, as you can see in our case, she was older than 40, so it's not, not to be discounted. Um, it is common in females, and Caucasians are more affected than other races. Moving on to pathophysiology, so Normal skeletal bone rewilding occurs at a rate of about 10 percent a year. However, in a normal OT capsule, we actually see very little bone rewilding, and we expect very little bone rewilding at a rate of less than 1 percent a year. However, in otosclerosis, you see bone rewilding has increased, and this leads to the accumulation of bony deposits that can damage the audiological mechanism and structures, and it worsens the normal transmission of sound. 
the extent of abnormal bulge modeling within the OT capsule actually directly correlates to the abnormal findings on the audiology. Uh, further uh, into the pathophysiology, so the Bolgi modeling occurs in three phases typically, and it's the otospongiosis phase, the transitional phase, and the otosclerotic phase. In the otospongiosis phase, there's an increase in both osteoclast activity as well as microvascularity. And here in histology, you see multiple active cells being like osteocytes and osteoblasts. The bone develops a really spongy appearance, and this because of this because of vascular dilatation and um, new vascularization. And also see um, a red hue behind it's a panic and then clinically, and this is known as the short sign. In the transitional phase, these deposits of spongy bone occur in areas of previous bone resorption. And then in the otosclerotic phase, the, the spongy bone deposits then develop into a very dense bone. And this narrows the microcirculation that, was, that, that had developed previously in the otospongiosis phase. <laughs> this can then further um, encroach into the membrane of the in terms of classification, so it's historically classified into clinical and histological otosclerosis. Histological otosclerosis is essentially seen um, in cadavers, um, so it doesn't uh, impact on our clinic, uh, us clinically. Um, clinical otosclerosis can be divided into stapedial, cochlear, or mixed. Um, in stapedial otosclerosis, we see fixation of the stapes, and this leads to a conductive hearing loss in cochlear, in cochlear form. Um, it proceeds upon the membrane that's lab, which resulting in a sensory neural hearing loss. And in the mixed, in the mixed pattern, we see the fixation of the stem piece as well as involvement of the lab, thus resulting in mixed hearing loss. Just further into the types so of the picture, quite nicely um, illustrates um, the, the way the, uh, the location of the um, uh, aberrant lesions. So the, Stapedial uh, otosclerosis is the commonest type, occurs in 80% of cases. It's also called finestral, um, and it, as you can see from the picture, it occurs in an anterior crust, the posterior crust, it can be circumferential over the foot plate, the whisker type, and also the obliterative type. The cochlear type is less common, also called retrofenestral, and it occurs in the round window of the cochlear region. You can also get lesions on the in anterior segment of the internal auditory canal, and um, in 70 to 80 percent of cases, it occurs um, in bilateral. So, in terms of etiology, as, as of now, uh, etiology is unknown. However, there are several proposed um, etiological mechanisms, the first one in genetics. Um, so, uh, according to the literature, up to 50 percent of the family history of the disease, which is significant. Um, and it's typically described as an autosomal dominant um, inheritance pattern with incomplete penetration. Um, hormones have also been um, described as a possible contributor. However, these are not causative. It's more um, uh, it exacerbates an underlying area, not in, in patients who have pre-existing autosclerosis. Measles exposure is quite uh, widely quoted in literature as being um, positive, however, the exact etiology of, of this mechanism is still unknown. Um, and the inflammation. So there's multiple cascades of inflammatory cytokines that are playing released from the spongy bone deposits during the early stages of the disease. Um, go to spongiosis phase. However, there's, as of now, there's no specific inflammatory mediator or cytokine or autoimmune disease even that has been um, that, uh, found to be directly linked to uh, otosclerosis or cause otosclerosis. So, um, moving on to the clinical assessment, so I guess you what's important to ask um, as in any patient who presents with the with, um, etiological um, quality. So, hearing loss, uh, specifically, these patients describe hearing loss as greatest in their low terms of frequencies. They also can typically describe difficulty hearing male voices or vowel sounds, and it usually starts in one ear later and to the other. It's also paracusis willacy, which is a ability to hear be better in noisy environments, um, which is paradox. So, what do you think? Um, and then tinnitus, 50% uh, of patients actually report tinnitus and it's uh, typically drawing or buzzing in nature. Uh, vertigo is less common um, and it's not present unless this, uh, the disease process has extended to affect the semi circular canals. And as I mentioned earlier, 80% in the bilateral and 50% will support the families according to the literature. Um, clinically, when assessing the patients, the is typically normal. Um, however, we should look out for the short side. 
um, and this is increased deadness in long term monitoring of the tympanic membrane. It's however quite inconsistently found, and it's not um, necessary uh, to make a diagnosis. Okay, gestation tube function is typically normal. From two main four tests, we see um, a picture of conductive yearly loss. So, Jane shows a, a, a bone conduction better than air conduction, and we were, will then lateralize to the affected here. Um, moving on to uh, um, uh, audiometry. So, what an audiogram does is it measures air and bone conduction through various frequencies at various loudness levels, and the urgent threshold of more than 35 decibels is said to be abnormal. Otosclerosis will typically be seen with a low frequency conduct of urgent loss. And then you also can see the pattern of a car heart notch, which is a loss of bone conduction at 2000 hertz. And this is a slightly to be considered an indicator of otosclerosis. However, quite the recent literature review done in 2013, sorry, 2013 showed that there is actually little support for the predictive value of a car heart notch and diagnosing otosclerosis. Sorry, this is a space thing. Um, and so that's why um, other aspects of the clinical exam. Um, and features on the audio gram um, should be considered. Um, in terms of tympanometry, so this is a measure of um, acoustic energy transmission. It's often normal in patients with otosclerosis. However, um, don't discount it as you may get a picture of flatter curve and type A is um, tympanogram, which may, do, uh, which may indicate that there's a severe acicular change in the dysfunction. In terms of imaging, so CTs are typically done as your first um, imaging of choice. Um, they have a very high sensitivity and specificity and can reveal variations in the anatomy and severity of the disease. The common findings on a high CT include uh, an increased uh, body radio recency in the OT capsule, especially, especially around the anterior footprint, in the thickening of the stapes and widening of the oval window. Can also reveal cochlear involvement and by demonstrating the double gene sign, which is a demandalized area which outlines the cochlea. However, the main disadvantage is cost and availability um, yeah, in most things. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, management. So, sort of the pharmacological management should be stressed that this is not the mainstream of, of managing these patients, and as the efficacy of any of the agents that are being proposed is still very much in question. So some of the agents are sodium fluoride, bisphosphonates, and vitamin D. Sodium fluoride is the most commonly prescribed medication. Um, this is, I think, more in, in, the, in the northern hemisphere. However, evidence to support its use is still very limited and also quite conflicting. However, its mechanism or how it's supposed to work is that it acts as an antagonist to bony gene modeling and osteoplast activation. Um, and it's supposed to hasten the maturity of any active focus and digest for the cochlear loss. But the adequate dosage and timing and duration of treatment are all yet to, to still be determined. Um, the bisphosphonates and vitamin D are also now treatments being considered as possible future management, uh, future management possible, I guess, in these patients. Um, however, research is still um, in the early phases. Okay, so this is um, moving on to um, so surgical management. So um, uh, it's quite a long list I've got here, but the indication and contraindications are quite important. So indications for surgery is any one of the conduct of hearing loss and able to react at least 15 to 20 decibels. If they've got speech discrimination scores of 60% or greater, and the patient should have good overall medical condition and minimal comorbidities. But the indications of anyone with really poor overall condition, someone who has the only, an only hearing ear, anyone in the active stage, so if you see a short sign, it's an indicator. Any conducted hearing loss from a cause other than status fixation, so for example, someone with symptom sclerosis, a fluctuating hearing loss of vertigo, and population of the panic and get any infection, and the hearing loss of more than 70 decibels or, or, or worse. Unless that patient has a speech discrimination score of 80% or better, which is quite important. Okay, so, the operative treatment um, is essentially steady surgery. So, steady surgery restores the mechanical transmission of sound throughout, through the middle ear. Yeah. It doesn't relate any sensory neural hearing loss, um, certainly to disease extension of the cochlea, which is important to stress and mention to the patient. Um, and there's two variations in the surgery a stapedectomy and a stapedotomy. Stapedectomy is 
with food plates in Pura, both removed and it's like an entire structure in place with the trust pieces. And it's like a bottom is where small holes made in the center aspect of the food plate uh, for, for insertion and positioning of the pieces without removing the similar structure. So, pre operative casting of these patients is like any other procedure, it is of the same sort of thing. So, um, the options for treatment should always be discussed um, and the advantages and disadvantages for each. So, just to summarize, the best surgical candidate is someone who's had a previously unoperated ear, has very good overall health, has an unacceptable air bone gap, and the minimum is 20 decibels, and also has excellent speech discrimination scores of more than 60 years. So, this image just um, in a States to you what the state protecting is. So on the um, in which A you can see the state the state piece is still inside you, and B is where the state is being removed and replaced by a person. You get various types of prostheses, they various shapes and various materials. These are just a few pictures to demonstrate how they look. Uh stapodotomy. So there was a research for Vincent and his colleagues in um a few years ago, uh, who did a review of more than 3,000 state pedotomies, and their conclusion was <laughs> that it's a safe and uh, successful um, procedure in treating a conductive hearing loss in more than 90%, close to 95% of patients. Um, the surgical complications um, are quite rare, but can include things like a sensory needle, sensory needle hearing loss which can be immediately delayed, the closest of the ears, uh, perforation of the TM. Um, uh, in injury to the facial nerve, which can be needed or in a taste disturbance, is a sacrifice, sacrificing the um, the period of gasha, floating, subluxed state, is fulfilled with vertigo. Surgical failure commonly results from a uh, prosthesis that's not positioned, or if there's an inclinative prosthesis left. Uh, the stables were so quite busy. I'm going to kind of go through all of it, but it's basically a comparison of state protectomies and state protectomies according to various um, categories. So, in principle, they are both different. Um, as I mentioned earlier, state protectomies removal of the foot plate and insertion of a prosthesis and surrounding the seal. Um, and state protectomies are creation of a venous station and insertion of prosthesis. In terms of technique, they are quite different. Um, and the, the risk of damage to the inner ear is far more in the state of than in the state of and there's also a higher chance of prosthesis migration in the state of In terms of results, the risk of an immediate sensory renal hearing loss is quoted as one and a half percent in the state of The risk of a delayed sensory renal hearing loss um, is quoted as a rate of 95 decibels per decade for state of and three and a half um, per decade for state of Um and in terms of complications, the occurrence, frequency, and duration of vestibular symptoms is simply be greater in state of Okay, so post operative counseling also a very important part to manage patients. So we should tell them about um, to be very cautious with mobilizing because um, vertigo or dizziness may occur, and this actually may persist for several days post operatively. Um, they should always be gentle, nose blowing, and coughing and sneezing with the mouth open. They should avoid saying, Maybe the baby bend rapidly for two to four weeks, which should avoid lying on the operated ear and more than precautions for at least six to eight weeks. Um, if you have a situation of a conductive hearing loss after stable surgery, things you should consider um, are, are these this just that I've been doing. So, um, defixation of the mobilized foot, of the case mobilized foot plate, a prosthesis that's now become adherent to the edge of the oval window, if this process closure of the oval window. You can get acid necrosis of the lung versus of the impus, you can get a slip prosthesis, and also ankylosis of the malleus of the impus to the attic wall. Okay, moving on to non objective management, so here is essentially the mainstay. So these are the, an alternative for patients who are not candidates for state surgery, and as I mentioned, they're in the long list of contraindications in a few slides ago. Um, and or it can be for those who require um, sensory neural hearing loss correction. So you might have a patient who you offer safety surgery to, but they are also required to maintain the hearing loss of more than 25 is spelled, um, qualifies you as a candidate for hearing aid. Um, just the downside of hearing aids is that it can be quite expensive because patients are expected to fund their own batteries and um, 
which you may need to change up to uh, twice a month or even two weeks. Um, and they also made by multiple hospital visits for sizing and adjustment, and they can accept this interpretation and fiction of the external or the different amount. Alternative options. So, implantable hearing aids are now being used in patients with autosclerosis. Um, and these advanced the acoustic signal transmitted to the front here, however, uh, taken to the right of the question of options that you have middle ear implants, bone conducting implants, and also hydrogen systems. Okay, so that brings me to the end. Um, autosclerosis is essentially a place of the typical form of hearing loss. Um, improvements in technology have led to additional diagnostic techniques, um, improvements in audiology, as well as advancements and advancements in treatment. Research in certain treatments are also ongoing. And um, understanding this complex disease leads to an earlier diagnosis of the to follow appropriate treatment, as well as improved patient education for those with autosclerosis. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Um, and then firstly, you showed a cone, that is a cone being CT that you showed. It's very difficult to see, uh, I just want to focus on a cone being CT. So, you know, the reason we scan, no, we can get cone being CTs a lot faster than we can get a high being CT scan. So usually if I ask for a COVID CT, I want to exclude either something that's going to be a contraindication towards that surgery or something that or an additional diagnosis. Be it something I have to counsel a patient about. So it's just important to say that you that you know if we if you ask for a COVID CT, you can't say there's no extra focus because you can't see that in certain limitations. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is in that table that you showed where they had sensory neural hearing loss with respect to Dr. Estepidectomy, I'm not sure how they, how do you conclude that because it may just be ongoing disease. Yeah. So I don't know where you got that from. Is that from a publication or from a textbook? Yeah, it's from a publication. Yeah, I think it's very, it's a, it's a very tricky statement to make because yeah. then you can your patient, yes, with the surgery, you can get delayed centrineural hearing of 9.5 decibels per decade. Yeah. And, and how do you know that that's not from an active from active disease? Yeah. Because some patients are, still have active disease. You're doing the surgery for the conductive component. Yeah. That's not stopping the disease. They still have active disease. So what I usually tell patients is, um, this is going to help the conductive component. There is a risk of centrineural hearing loss that's related to the surgery. But there's also a risk that develops with the disease itself. Mm -hmm. And so even if the surgery is incredibly successful, you can still develop progressive hearing loss, either due to presbyacusis as, as you advance with age or because of active disease. Mm -hmm. so, and some people advance quite rapidly and some people quite, you know, they, they may or may not do. So, so that varies. And there's no way of predicting that. Yeah. You can't even predict that on a CT scan. So, sorry, Tanzania, I just want to get it clear. So, you're referring to the cochlear. I'm referring to the cochlear obstructors, yes. You know, there's no way of predicting that in the scan. And even if someone has cochlear obstructors on the scan, you can't say you're going to progress very quickly. You said there's a high probability that you're going to develop sensory neural hearing loss irrespective of the surgery. And that you have to understand. So, that's the other thing. And the third thing is, um, oh, now I've forgotten. Oh, this the speech lady, this is just a question for the people taking exams. <laughs> and feel free to call on your fellow. <laughs> um, speech discrimination score. So what would you say the significance of the speech discrimination score? Because Layla mentioned speech discrimination score of about 60%. Yeah. When is it relevant? I mean, when, when, yeah. Yes. When you've got a retrograde ability. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, so you can check if there is a rollover in case of the retrograde ability, because that's, you know, if you not choose a ratio. But yeah, I'm not sure. Wait, what, what, do you understand, do you understand the question? What's the clinical significance of that? So I, I I must say, when I see a purely conductive loss, because you, see, you sometimes see those audio brands and it's just conductive loss. 
and and often we don't even get to teach speech discrimination mm -hmm. Assume that speech discrimination scores can be good, but when is it really important to look at that speech discrimination score? Erasmus? So, yeah, I'll sorry. Think one would be for asymmetry. In this yeah. case, the other is, like you said, if you've got a peer conductor loss, you always expect them to achieve yes. 100%. You've got a mixed loss, exactly. one that says what's retro for the next one, what's the next one. Exactly. So, so we've got a mixed loss. There's probably a high, high chance of cognitive sclerosis, less likely to be surgery to successful, or you might need to supplement that. Yeah, so, so, so that's so why it's getting discrimination. It's not just sclerosis. We're really deciding between really a cochlear implant or a stable dot, and you want the hearing again. Dax uh, direct, you know, the more even public trust. Yeah, so it's when it's really when you've got a mixed hearing loss. So otherwise, I, I, I must say, I, I usually don't look at speech if it's just a purely conduct loss because I expect that speech. Something that you should do, and I think if I do, if I don't, it's just an oversight on my side because you should just look at everything. And then um, the other thing is if you've got a mixed loss like that, when would you consider surgery? If you've got a mixed loss, when, when would you when the patient came to you and you got the same probably a stress, when would you consider the surgery patient? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if they've worked home, if they've worked so simple, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, in case we close the app again, they can get more benefit from from the end. So I would say if they've worked here, um, um, better than, um, I'd say better than, uh, uh, the acute one average is better than the yeah. end of the yeah. yeah, so, so what, um, how I would approach that is if you have a patient with a mixed loss, you're going to counsel them about hearing aids because they don't need hearing aids anyway. So I would always offer that patient a hearing aid first. Always, if they've got so, and then if the hearing aids are no longer benefiting, you can consider surgery. And when is surgery going to help a patient with a mixed loss? You look at the size of the ear bone gap. Mm -hmm. If you've got a patient with a mix with a mixed hearing loss, and they say they're not benefiting from the hearing aid, but that ear bone gap is not greater than thirty decibel, then you're doing a safe adoption is not really going to make a difference. So, you know, if it's a patient with a small ear bone gap, unless that ear bone gap is greater than 30 decibels, your surgery is not going to be any So, I wouldn't even offer them a state of doctor with a small ear bone gap, even if it was a mixed loss, and they said they They're not benefiting, you probably, then you need to look at once again, you look at the speech discrimination score, and you're probably looking towards a cut point. Can you go back to the audiogram you showed? Sure. I was interested that he was taking an MRI scan. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure what the MRI scan is. Yeah, so I'm not sure why. So that absolutely, I'm not sure why this patient had an MRI scan. I can tell you that was not discussed with any consultants. Yeah, yeah, so you yeah. wouldn't ask. Well, absolutely not. No. And I think I think please be please be very careful about asking for investigations like that, especially in our eyes at our hospital. It's it's. It's not, it's not like a, a full that count that you're taking. It's, it's quite an expensive resource, and you don't want to ask for unnecessary investigations. Yeah. I think I brought this up before. I don't know if it would be nice to discuss it all as a department is what we're going to use as the definition of typical asymmetry because there's no, it's a lot of lack of consensus in the literature. There's one. Um, I think a lot of people are using differences in pure term average, or you know, so if you use a lot of different definitions, you will like to end up with it. Yeah, I mean, that is a myth that's about the mixed ones. So I go on, I look at three, three kilohertz, yeah, or you can even I look at three consecutive frequencies or the one three kilohertz. I mean, I, I tend to look at three consecutive frequencies, but in a patient like this, I would not ask for an MRI scan. This is a bilateral mixed loss, yeah. 
Yes, it's something I got wrong in the past is when you do an information bilateral suspected motor sclerosis, but successful surgery on the one year um, for the, the EUA plus minus um, as they you have to, for the contract at the time. You have to wait at least one year before you start. I wouldn't do it. And the reason is, I mean, that's like, yeah. Thumbs up. But you want to make sure that nothing happens in between in that time. You know, that I mean, it literally is a thumbs up. Yes. It's literally just to make sure that nothing happens to that ear, that there isn't a erosion of the skin, that there isn't a displacement, that they don't do, you know. But I think it's, that's it's better yeah, to say it's safe practice to do that. Yeah. All the questions will go start. You can. You're the one who's going to be on the receiving end soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no reason. No reason. Yeah. Just need to, to, to uh, um, eight, when just just be careful in times, you know, you, you go just it's but a mask on that she's You can't then plan your management based on that and uh, <laughs> I guess in that case, then you have to, you have to plan your management based on the history and uh, the training for examination. Like, for example, that what you can get inside that's a mask for infection. I think just because of the masking diagram, that is what you should have to take my yeah. Just something that you only say to. Yeah, yeah wait. Yeah, there's no, no questions. Okay. I just wanted to add, uh, I came across a study, I think, of getting pregnancy in post-nemesis. I think about 2,000 uh, wanted to understand how to say getting pregnancy in post-nemesis. They know that I think one is in the image of post-nemesis, beginning with pregnancy, but most prevalent is usually the same as the series, 25% of patients and the same as the series. So I think they, I think they still have a level of understanding, the same of the world. So, is there anything on advice regarding surgery prior to the historically that was finished? No, I also that I mean you 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 have to go to counseling, right? But every week we have patients who are working age who say I can't afford a hearing aid, they don't qualify according to our criteria. And I, I need to work, I work in a bank, I can't perform my work, so I'm going to do the surgery, whether you complete with your family or not. And if they say that pregnancy worsens your otosclerosis, well, what does it worsen? The cochlear component or the fixity of the foot plate? If it's the fixity of the foot plate, well, it's got a piston in there. Mm -hmm. And if they say saying you can develop a cochlear otosclerosis, and that can happen in a patient anyway. Yeah, I'm not saying that pregnancy doesn't make it worse. But are you going to say this is a contraindication? <clears throat> you you do still planning to have five more kids. I'm not doing your special doctor. I think that's a little bit impractical. I think it boils down to counseling. Um, I mean, I have done special doctors on women who have not yet completed their families and women who, who have come for surgery and you know they, they may develop worsening of their distress, but it's probably confirmed that it would happen anyway. So it's always really boils down to counseling. If someone comes to you, especially if someone comes to you and says, Well, I need to be able to hear now and I can't afford hearing it. Yeah. Why does it get I think it's a woman. But I mean, what part of the. Well, this is the thing. It could be, you know, you don't know. I mean, if it's the cochlear component, then it's not going to be affected by your, by your surgery. They probably will need a hearing aid anyway. And that, but that comes down to counseling, and you tell them if the coughing of the gets worse, a surgery, the, the otosclerotic, the, the surgery, the productive component, the hearing aid will help you, but obviously the coughing of the will get worse. So, if you've done a study with a little scans of No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, but the people of, I don't know, Charles, have you read any? Or later? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and you like you always offer the patients the hearing aid if the space line for the other patients that you offer. I always tell patients both options. I mean, listen, if it was me, <coughs> I would probably have a hearing aid rather than a step doctor, to be honest. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's like it's an all or nothing thing. So if it personally, if it was me, I would go for hearing it. I would not want anybody because it, it, it's it's so you have to you have to tell because what's gonna happen and I think if there's one thing I've learned, you have to be very careful how you counsel. If you came to me and I said, you know, Charles, you need surgery. That person's going to come away thinking that this is the only thing that's going to help them, and you haven't told them the other option. I think the ethic you have to tell patients there are two options if you have surgery, or you can have a hearing aid. And there's pros and cons to both. You make that decision, and then you come and tell me what you would like. You do not counsel your stuff. This is not a cholesteatoma. This is a stethodoxy. And I think that's quite a big thing that goes away. And, and uh, so I think you have to be very careful about that. Patients can still sue you even if you counsel them. They, they, medically, legally, that consent form doesn't protect you from being sued. And it, it, they're less likely to sue you if you told them about that risk and you offered them the other options. Then you can say, This is, I've consented you and you're waiting this, you know, that's what they're less likely to do. So I think you have to. In the UK, a lot of units uh, consider adequate consent to trial of the hearing aids or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's, but it's more than that, you know. I mean, a patient may still consent, assuming that you do this every day. You have to tell the patient, yeah. this, is, this is my first day in private practice. They're not going to come if this is your first day in doctor. So how much do you tell the patient? And that's where I think they can see. Mm-hmm. Because they can they will ask you before how many have you done? Oh, no. <laughs> Did you tell the patient that? Yeah, you know this. Yeah, that's when it's come in with a sign people really pop. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like my sign will be really pop and drink them lovely you can make. And then you get some case and I will come back to so you can say you see it's just pop. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 the good thing about this is that you know there's, there's a publication that said that you as a surgeon you never you never plateau when you're learning Um I think it was I think it's Ferdin. So he is together this whole book of which is a number of publications that has come together as a book and, and he said that you almost never never plateau when you're learning curve with the surgery. And so when you start off with this operation, you know, when you feel you're ready to do it, you literally, you have to have the best anesthetist, your, your best equipment, your best instruments, your best scrub nurse, because all of those things, no coffee in the morning. You literally have to be at your first, first thing in the morning so that you're not fatigued, not never again. So I never do this in the afternoon. I will never tell you to prepare stapies on a Wednesday afternoon, ever. Have I ever done that? It's always in the morning. If it's not in the morning, it's not that day. So all of those things, um, you know, are important. So if you, I mean, it applies to most things in surgery, but particularly with this. You're never going to do your first case with an anesthetist you don't like, a scrub system who doesn't know what she's doing, and you don't have all the instruments there. And by all the instruments, I mean the perforators, the seater, the laser. Every person that you, you know, the person usually that you're comfortable with, and then obviously another one just in case. So the other conditions really have to be optimal. Can I ask a question? Sorry, yes, I need sorry. to run quickly. Um, is there any measurements that you use to predict your access uh, on the CT scan uh, regarding the, the facial nerve? Uh, you know, if it's too low or overhanging? Oh, you know, Vincent, the, the thought is if it's more than just the percent of the hanging, then you're probably not going to be able to get a piston in. I mean, you can always drill along the... Uh, How do you could see that on the CT? What's that? No, I'm not. I'm not looking intraoperatively. 
Okay, so there's no um, measurement that you can use on the coronal prices to see if there's, uh, you know, if you've got enough space to get the person in. Would you look on the coronal slices preoperatively on the CT? I think it will. It's actually give you a very good idea. If you've got a very overhanging facial lobe, you can see that. But I think anything less than overhanging, you'd have to look intraoperatively. And I mean, if, if you find it's overhanging and it's, if it's 50% or less, you can still get a person in. It may be that you need to convert to a manual stethoscope and take the impus out to create full space or drill along the promontory so that you can get your piston in. But a facial nerve that's touching the piston is usually not a problem. If you can okay. get you have space to do your uh, stethoscope. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I can't remember the value, but I think uh, what it's at least showing me is a specific measurement that he uses to see if there's enough space. But I, I can't remember any. Again. So, if someone, that, I think you have to give someone that sometimes uses a specific measurement. No, I don't know that measurement. Yeah, I must say, I, I always go intraoperatively. Yeah. Thank so you. I think it's much better idea, you know, intraoperatively. Yeah. I think you have to be very careful. I don't have a kind of age in my head, but I I generally wouldn't do the, the oldest step of doctor me I've done is in a lady who's 67, but she's a marathon runner and she was still working. Um, and she did incredibly well. But I think you have to be very careful in in, in, in much older people because they the Risk of severe issues are going to be higher and then it's likely to compensate. So, for that, that yeah, in kids, yeah, I'm also I'm very conservative in the pediatric population. I think I, need, I would never actually do it in anyone who was less than 18 because the, the reason is you making that decision, the parents are making that decision on behalf of the child, they don't understand the risk, the child doesn't understand the risk. And so I never actually offer, I offer a hearing aid, and I feel that when that when that person is old enough to participate in the consent process and understand the risks, then you can offer it to, to a younger person. But I generally don't. I guess it's not like a coffee if one no. really exhausted a hearing aid option. You know, by the time a patient needs a coffee if one, you kind of already said that this child is probably not benefiting with yes. the hearing aid. It's like and it's all about having insight to that risk. I mean, would you offer? If, if your son had uh, oversclerosis, would you offer him no. say the doctor's piece or would you offer him no. a hearing aid first? Yeah. But you have to really make that decision when he's old enough to make it. Yeah. yeah. What's the youngest age you've seen? I have heard <laughs> of someone doing it in the age of, uh, if you mean seen it, I've seen it. So when we have to oversclerosis, when is the youngest age you've seen? Well, this is the thing. I think if, if, it's, if it's a really it's young age, you've got a. You've got a, a one where there's not a congenital fixation, which can also occur. So, but, but in a case like that, where it's congenital fixation of the foot plate, even if it's not osteosis, I wouldn't offer a second up to me. Yeah. But then obviously it's not osteosis, it's congenital fixation. But this is the risk you do not do Yes. Later. Yeah, much later. Yeah. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of the meeting. Thanks to everyone who joined. Um, yeah, we'll see you next week again. Thank you.